In the world of exotic sports cars, British manufacturer Lotus is known for building race cars that are essentially street legal sports cars. Cars like the Exige and the Elise quickly come to mind. However, 10 years ago, the company introduced this, the Evora. They claimed it was the most comfortable GT style mid engine sports car that they ever produced. And of course, over the years, Lotus made some small changes, but remember, this is still a rare sighting on today's roads, even in 2021. Now, in 2020, Lotus introduced the most powerful version of the Evora called the Evora GT. And today I'm here in Malibu, California, of course, with the 2021 version. This is going to be the last model year of the Evora because a new replacement is coming for 2022. And with 416 horsepower underneath the hood from its Toyota Source 3.5 liter V6, V6, this is the most powerful production Lotus that the company has ever produced. So if you guys are in the market for a rare six-speed manual raw mid-engine sports car, how does the 2021 Evora GT stack up? Stay tuned to find out. So it has been many years since I showed you guys an Evora on the channel. In fact, over the years, Lotus has made so little changes to the vehicle that I really haven't had a need to review one. However, they made a big change in 2020. So now that I have this 2021 Evora GT in person, let's kind of go over some of the small changes that Lotus has made. Because remember, this is going to be essentially be the final hurrah to the Evora until the Amira replaces it next year. And for a car that came out back in 2010, I am just shocked how incredibly beautiful this vehicle still is. It still turns a lot of heads when you have it out on the road because a lot of people don't realize what it is. Lotus is not really a brand name that is known among non-car people. Of course, car people know what this is when they see one and they get so excited. But really, if you're looking for a rare sports car that's going to turn a lot of heads and it also gives you the most raw feeling on the road that you can buy today, this essentially is it. Even though Lotus claims this is a road legal GT style sports car, this is by Lotus standards. And we'll talk about that, of course, as we go into the driving portion. Now, of course, because this is an old car, you do only get bi xenon headlights as standard. That's standard equipment on all vehicles. You have bi xenon or you have high intensity headlights for the low and the high beam. There is an LED daytime running light. And then this is the LED turn signal that also serves as the a daytime running light, no fog lights on the vehicle, but you can see a lot of the vents on this car obviously are functional. That's going to help with cooling. It's going to help with downforce. My tester has a $10,000 carbon fiber pack that essentially lightens the overall weight by about 50 pounds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you have already a lightweight car, it's going to, of course, um, significantly affect the handling. Now you can see here, a lot of the hood vents here are functional. There's some genuine carbon fiber here. The hood, I couldn't actually get to open. I couldn't find the release for the hood on this vehicle. There is no frunk from what I'm told, uh, but in this Daytona blue color, this is essentially one of my favorite colors you can find on the Evora today. Now, of course, in terms of the design or the size, this vehicle competes with cars like the Porsche Cayman GT4. They have roughly the same horsepower and torque, uh, and it's also roughly around the same size at 173 inches long. This vehicle is a mid-engine rear-wheel drive sports car. As you guys know, these wheels come with the carbon fiber pack. They also come with Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tires. Uh, they're wrapped in 19 inch wheels. They are a staggered setup. There are 245s in the front. These tires, of course, with those upgraded brakes are gonna give the Evora GT plenty of grip. Now, of course, looking at it from the side angle here, you can really see just how exotic looking this car is. There are a lot of functional vents, of course. This allows the mid-engine V6 to get air. The roof, as you can see, is carbon fiber. That's gonna help lower the center of gravity of the vehicle, and it's really going to improve the handling characteristics. Now, looking at the rear of the vehicle, this is where you're gonna see most of the changes that Lotus made um, in the last couple of years. The rear end has the same signature full LED taillights, which look good. There's now the Lotus on the back that spells, that's been spelled out with the carbon fiber. That's all part of the carbon fiber package. And then you can see here a lot of functional vents here that allows for air to pass through. Your reverse lights are back here. And then you can see the exhaust system. This engine sounds phenomenal. Let's go ahead and fire it up so you can hear how it sounds. I bet you didn't realize that a Toyota V6 could sound that good. Now, of course, underneath this rear hatch, you're gonna find the engine and the trunk. So let's go ahead and show you guys that really quick. 
Now, because this is made from carbon fiber, it is one of the lightest rear hatches that I've ever seen. And it's also interesting because Lotus doesn't actually use struts to support this. It actually uses a prop rod, uh, which is also the area where you can see the engine and you'll find the trunk capacity. Uh, the trunk space here is not big and it also doesn't have a front trunk. So keep that in mind if you guys plan to use this as your only vehicle as a daily driver per se. Now, in terms of the cargo space, you can see it barely fits my backpack here that holds my camera equipment. I have a roller bag, a 22 inch roller bag. It's in the back seat because it doesn't actually fit back here. But Lotus says there's six cubic feet of space back here. Where? That's where I want to know where it is because this is relatively deep, but it's also not very wide. So you can't really fit bulkier items in here. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind if you plan to use this on a longer trip. Now, of course, the engine here in all of its beauty is a Toyota sourced 3.5 liter V6 engine that also has an Edelbrock supercharger bolted on to the top of the motor that pushes out 8.7 PSI of boost. This engine is essentially the same engine that you'll find in a Toyota Camry. That's right, you can see right there on the mass airflow flow sensor, it says Toyota Denso. This is a Toyota sourced V6. It still is, it always has been since the Evora came out. It makes now 416 horsepower and 317 pound feet of torque. This has slightly less torque because it's the six speed manual. If you guys go for the six speed automatic, it'll have 332 pound feet of torque, which is pretty good numbers. Those numbers practically match uh, the same numbers that you'll find in the four liter flat six in a Cayman GT4. So very impressive power. Lotus has upped the power by about 71 ponies compared to the 2014 Lotus Evora that I first drove all those years ago. Now, of course, my tester has a six speed manual. These are only rear wheel drive. They come with a limited slip differential, which is going to be, of course, needed for getting that power onto the road. Fuel economy is also rated at 17 in the city, 26 on the highway. So decent gas mileage considering the performance capabilities of this vehicle. Lotus says this car should sprint to 60 in about 3.8 seconds, and it has a top speed of 188 miles per hour. So even though this is an old sports car, it still has pretty impressive specs. And of course, this is also a Lotus. Lightweight is part of the formula. And as this one sits, it weighs in at just over 3,100 pounds. So now that we've talked about the beautiful exterior of the Evora GT, let's hop into the interior. The first thing I want to show you guys, here is the Lotus Evora key fob. This is still very much an old Lotus key that they've been using since this car came out almost 10 years ago. It doesn't include smart key access. You actually have to use the physical key, or you can also push and hold the lock and unlock buttons to lock the vehicle. You push the Lotus button over here on the key fob that locks the doors. You can see the mirrors fold in to unlock it. You push this blank button right here below the Lotus button and that will unlock the door for you. It even has an old school style key insert there on the door. Now, opening up the door, you can see my tester has these very, very attractive uh, carbon fiber bucket seats that really hold you in place. Unfortunately, they only adjust basically for recline and for forward and back. You can't adjust the height of it. You can't adjust these bolsters. They are really basically firm seat and you need to try them out to make sure that they work for you. I don't particularly think they work for me especially well, uh, I got a little uncomfortable on my longer trip, but you can't argue just how beautiful these seats look. It reminds you you're in a race car. Now looking at the door panel, you can see lots of good materials in here. This car is hand assembled, of course, in England. You have leather on the door panels here, stitching, of course, stitching and suede Alcantara. You'll find along the entire door panel, you have a um, piano black pl plastic accented door handle, and you have relatively decent quality switch gear in here but you also will find a couple of parts sharing switch gear here that I might even recognize from a Ford product, which is a little bit interesting. Now, this is a really low sports car, uh, and unlike the Exige and Elise, which had really wide um, tunnels right here, or a really wide sill, door sill, the Evora is a little bit better in that regard, but still, you have to kind of duck as you get in, and you still have to kind of avoid this right here, which is kind of a pain. This was a lot easier when I was in my 20s, now, as I'm getting to my 30s, I think I'm just getting old and I, I think this is a little bit annoying to get in and out of. But once you're in and you shut the door, you can see uh, the door has a relatively solid sounding thunk. And then starting this car is a two step process. You have to stick the key in the ignition, which some of you purists out there will like. You turn the key all the way to the end of the cycle. And then you, because it's a manual, you have to put the clutch in, obviously. And then the button to fire up the engine is over here. And then of course, once the uh, engine starts up, it sounds fantastic. It even has a sport mode for the exhaust. <laughs> That's gonna be fun as we go into the driving scene. But let me just show you a brief overview of the interior. Now, first of all, there is a back seat back here. 
But uh, as you can see, I'm putting my suitcase back there because you wouldn't want to put any friends back there that uh, you enjoy, that you liked. Basically people with no legs or cargo back there, there's no room back there. It's just used for storage essentially. But in terms of the materials, you can see the um, dashboard has the same nice stitching here with the leather along the entire dash. You can see it's got an old school airbag cover there. Uh, your vents are up all the way back here. They're a little bit hard to reach. They're kind of far. You have genuine carbon fiber here on the instrument panel hood. That's all part of the carbon fiber track or the carbon fiber package. The steering wheel, you can see nice flat bottom design. The horn, it sounds pretty dinky for this little car, but hey, I mean, what do you expect? Um, the steering wheel does adjust for just uh, tilt, but no telescoping function. I wasn't expecting that. It does come with cruise control, of course, but no steering wheel audio controls. You push this little button here at the end of the stock. You can kind of change what the display over there looks like. It looks really old as well and also is a little bit slow to change the look although some of you may also like the traditional analog style there for the speed and the tachometer you've got this seven inch alpine head unit here which does include apple carplay and android auto you essentially have to plug in your phone here it's a wired connection but once you do that I'm trying to do it with one hand here is a little bit of a pain once you do that it pops up here on the screen it also includes a uh, Bluetooth capability, but this screen is very, very aftermarket. It's essentially what uh, you might find when you go to just like any aftermarket store like Best Buy, you'll find that here. Uh, this is a pretty old screen. The screen, as you can see, the resolution isn't that great, uh, but at least it has Apple CarPlay, so that's nice. It also has a backup camera. When I go into reverse here, you can see there's a really terrible quality resolution there. So the tech in here is not wonderful. There are relatively nice feeling buttons here. There is just a one level heated uh, heated front seats, which is great. You have a uh, glove compartment over here, which opens up. It's really, really small. It's not damped or lined with felt. You have single zone manual climate control here with pretty straightforward buttons and controls. Um, I also like how they feel really nice. The shifter, it has relatively shorter throws, but I will say it doesn't feel like it likes to be rushed. It also has a nice metal gear shifter. So again, very, very mechanical reverses access by pulling up on that. You have a traditional hand style parking brake here, but no center console really here, no armrest, which would be nice. Although this is slightly padded over here, a little bit of cup holders over here. You have a 12 volt power outlet and then the USB cable is in here. But again, it looks like it's an aftermarket unit that actually comes from the factory. In terms of the visibility, um, it's okay in here. This is kind of thin, but you also sit really low uh, and you can't see anything out of the back. That's your view out of the back. As you can see, there's literally uh, just these little slats that kind of get in your way. But overall, uh, the seat comfort or the, the interior roominess feels okay. But just keep in mind, something like the Porsche Cayman is going to offer significantly more room. All right, so here I am in Malibu, California, the same place where I actually drove the Porsche Cayman or Boxster models, all of them basically. And I'm in the direct competitor, although this competes more with a Cayman, not necessarily a Boxster, but we are on probably the best roads you could, you could ever be on for a vehicle like this. And you also get to pass through tunnels, which is awesome because it allows you to basically do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god you couldn't get a camry to sound like that if you tried <laughs> and remember this is the same engine that was in a camry you know what even though i haven't driven this car in the last seven years lotus has obviously been making some changes and improvements to it it now has 71 more horsepower than the uh 2014 model <laughs> <laughs> un freaking believable that is just oh <laughs> and you know what this car despite how old it is on your on a road like this with no traffic in beautiful warm sunny california like this it is perfection does this car drive better than the boxster do i have more fun in this car at times lotus no, lotus seriously knows how to develop a chassis they know how to give you a mechanical, visceral, analog feel. This is the most mechanical car I have driven all this year. And it's amazing to me just how precise the car is. I mean, the steering is so quick and direct. The chassis stays so flat. The, st the suspension is stiffly sprung. The seats also hug you in place really nicely. And the engine is just so charismatic. I cannot believe this is a Toyota V6. And the cool thing is about it, when you look in the rearview mirror, I 
stomp my foot, I can literally see the throttle cable moving in the other direction as soon as my foot goes to the floor. It's basically also the waist, you can also see the waste gate of the supercharger, the Edelblock supercharger, and it's just a really cool experience. There's also no lag in this car. It just kind of goes so quickly. It, is, it just offers all of its horsepower, all of its torque, which is wonderful. This is a wonderful mechanical feeling car. Uh, and it just makes you feel like you're driving a race car. This feels like a race car that's disguised as a sports car. There is nothing else that drives quite as visceral as this car. Now, because it's a race car, it also is kind of annoying because it also is really a pain in the butt to drive. This vehicle has a really heavy clutch. The clutch is heavy. The engagement point is right at the end of the travel. It takes a little bit of time to get used to driving this vehicle smoothly. But once you do, it really does reward you. And also the six speed manual shifter, this is the transmission you're gonna wanna get, of course, with this car, because the automatic just isn't as good. <laughs> oh my God, this is fantastic. The automatic isn't as good as this. Oh. <laughs> but the shifter also feels a little bit like a Toyota truck. It doesn't have great, uh, precision through the gates and it's a little disappointing to drive something that's so imprecise at times it doesn't also like being hurried now if those of you who drive a truck with a manual transmission you're going to find like this transmission the shifter feels basically right at home but if you're coming from like a porsche this is going to feel really crude it's going to feel really unrefined <laughs> oh my god what an amazing machine oh i love this thing now my tester has the carbon pack for 10 grand, which lightens the car by about 50 pounds. And it doesn't sound like much, but when a car only weighs 3,100 pounds, it is pretty significant. You also have Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tires. When you get some temperature in these tires, the grip is phenomenal. This car definitely feels like it's glued to the road. Oh, <laughs> I love the sound of this V6. Does it sound better than the Porsche Flat 6? Yes and no, I mean, the Porsche Flat 6 is wonderful, but this has a unique characteristic, um, just pleasurable howl to it. <laughs> and also when the window's down, you can really hear the supercharger whine from that V6, it's fantastic. Oh, and it revs out to 6,000 or 7,000 RPM, but you, you do run into the, the rev limiter really quickly in this car, so you have to be careful and watch, your, watch the gear or watch the tack because if you start hearing it, you want to keep revving it. You want to keep letting this engine pull to like 8,000 RPM, but it won't do that. It actually will cut the power pretty abruptly at like 7,000. So yes, this is very much a driver's car still. But you really only let this, this car only really shines on roads like this, on smooth roads where there's no traffic. Because when you drive this vehicle in traffic, in rush hour traffic, for example, the ride quality beats you up. The chassis is very unsettled. I drove this car on the 405 freeway to get out here. And my God, at, at 70 miles an hour, 75 miles an hour, the front end is like this. And you feel like the car is gonna lift off the ground. It's just really crude. It feels like you're driving an old car. Like Lotus says this car is comfortable. It's a GT car, but that's by Lotus standards. This is not a comfortable car. This feels exactly like basically the, what you expect. Like if you're coming from an Elise or an Exige, this is the next progression, but it's still very brutal and harsh by Lotus standards. <laughs> Again, it doesn't like being rushed through the gates, so I find myself purposely slowing down my shifting. But when you get it right, this is a really rewarding car. In fact, with 416 horsepower, Lotus says this will accelerate to 60 in 3.8 seconds. Now, 3.8 seconds is not incredibly fast, especially in this segment. The one thing that I also really hate about this vehicle when you're driving it normally is the visibility in the back or the lack thereof. Literally, this car could use a rear view camera mirror. I look behind me and all I see is just slats. Because, But you do see the engine, which is nice, but God, look at this. As I go around this corner here, the car just feels so stable. It's incredible how good this car is. Oh my God. Really balanced chassis, really quick direct steering. <laughs> and it just wants to play. I would love to take this out to a track, but this is also where the car feels alive. It feels at home. The seats also hug you in place in this, these aggressive corners. 
Although I did find on long distance comfort on the highway, it wasn't the most comfortable seats. My back started to hurt. There is a refreshing lack of tech in this car. So if you're looking for like blind spot monitoring, automatic emergency braking, it's all absent here. Expect to find all that in the next generation Lotus sports car, the Amira. But the Evora is very much a pure driver's car. And the GT badge on it does not really stand for Grand Touring for me. It just stands for the most powerful version of the Evora. And this is still a true joy to drive. I could seriously just sit here all day long on these, or sit here in the driver's seat all day long and just drive these curvy roads. It is fantastic. Oh my God. But I think I might still be more comfortable in a Cayman simply because the Cayman just feels a lot more refined. It also feels safer. Like I don't feel like I'm gonna crash and die in this car, like in a Porsche, like in this car, I don't feel like I'd be very safe if I did and really <laughs> crash this thing into a pole or something, which we're not gonna do, obviously. So in my line of work, I am fortunate enough to be able to drive so many different types of vehicles, from SUVs to trucks to exotic sports cars. And I have to say, there isn't a car that I've driven this year that's quite as raw, quite as visceral, quite as mechanical as the 2021 Lotus Evora. And it basically stands for everything that Lotus is known for. I mean, yes, the company claims this is the most GT focused sports car they've ever made, but that is by Lotus standards, because as you guys saw, the ride quality in this vehicle isn't the best. You really have to live on these types of roads with the smooth, windy roads where there's no traffic to enjoy a vehicle like this. It really needs to be a toy car, a second car, because I personally would not want to daily drive this vehicle. Yes, it has a back seat that's useless for for passengers, it's really just good for cargo. Yes, it offers a relatively nice interior with good quality materials, but the tech in it is just a throwaway. You're essentially going to ignore the interior, focus on the seats that hug you, but aren't necessarily comfortable for me on longer drives, and just shift the transmission, listen to that V6, and just find your favorite back road because this car is seriously just a race car disguised, thinly disguised as a sports car. It's very much the Lotus way. Now, of course, there is a new replacement coming called the Amira next year. It's going to offer either a turbocharged Mercedes AMG four cylinder or the same three and a half liter V6 as this car with either a dual clutch or a manual transmission. I'll be excited to drive that sometime next year because it is going to be the last gas powered Lotus vehicle until the company decides to go all electric. Remember, this is a small exotic a British sports car company that of course needs to reinvent themselves if they're going to stay relevant. Now here's my main problem of course with the Evora because as good as this car is, she is really expensive. This vehicle starts at just under $97,000. $97,000 will get you lots of great sports cars. The Porsche Cayman comes to mind, to mind the Toyota Supra, the Porsche 911, the new Chevrolet Corv Corvette, the C8. Uh, and this one here with the, the options that it has, the $10,000 carbon fiber package, the $6,000 for the paint, a few other upcharges here, plus the destination, you're looking at an as-tested price of 116 grand. 116 grand is way too much money for something that is too much of a toy for me. If I'm gonna pay this much money, I want it to also be uh, usable in terms of using it on the road and also using it on the track. And for me, the Evora GT simply just doesn't meet that. I would rather just go for a Porsche Cayman GT4. However, keep in mind that this vehicle is going to be extremely rare. You see lots of Porsches on the road. This, however, is a Lotus. You don't see very many of these on the road. Everybody stares at it because they wonder what the heck it is when they finally do see it on the road. But with all that said, I hope you guys have enjoyed my full overview on the 2021 Lotus Evora GT. If you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews, like us on Facebook, and as always, guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video.